here today on this Happy Father's Day. Um, we had a lot going on in the life of the church here. If you could share with us.
Jason and Tony. We didn't want you back. Yeah. Any others? Don's carrying around a microphone if you have one, then you can let it up here. Okay. Our prayer then is um, on eagle's wings, and then we will also, this being the third Sunday, we'll sing the Lord's Prayer this Sunday. doctors and heal him. We pray for our church group that we would be able to raise the funds to keep our church dry and fix the roof. We pray for Chris Cook's mother Carol who's having a pacemaker placed in there. And for Jason and Tony as they travel, keep them safe. Lord, we thank you for all fathers. For new fathers who endure sleepless nights with infants in their arms. For busy fathers who juggle the pressures of home and family life. For the steadfast fathers who nurture and care for our special, vulnerable children. For the patient ones who always seem to forgive and engage their critiques. For persistent fathers who cleverly find new ways to connect with their many adults. We pray for all the imperfect fathers who are doing their best to love their children and their wife. We pray for the father who goes to work in the dark, many times come home to the family in the dark. We pray for the fathers and uncles who step in to cradle and care for nieces and nephews, for all granddads who love and support their precious grandchildren. For the father dads that are called to gather and cover the fragile ones. For the Sunday dads who care for our children and lead them in the faith. And for the dads who give far beyond their own resources, who overcome disabilities, to cherish and to love. We thank you for all of our beautiful fathers. Help us to support them and keep them in our prayers. Lord, we pray for a vacation Bible school and Jennifer and other adults. Lead our children into the love of God and let them know that they are cared for. Bless our church and bless all fathers as we come to worship you in your name. And we continue our time of prayer as we sing together the prayer that you taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. by the giving and receiving of the Lord's tithes and our offerings. I want to share with you what the bread pan offering is. Many of you know that the bread pan offering is an offering we take for missions. Sometimes it's local, sometimes it's regional, national, or international. Many times Christians have brought and taken Bibles to third world countries, places that people could read the Bible. Unfortunately, many people in third world countries do not read. And so giving them a paper Bible just really doesn't do a lot of good. There is a new mission organization called World Mission who are giving away MP3 players that have the entire Bible in their own language. And it costs, I think, around $25 for one of those. And what they do is they give that to the villages and they can listen to the Bible being read in their own language. Now you might say to yourself, well, that requires batteries. Well, not these. They're solar powered. And a lot of these third world countries have a lot of sun. So the nice part about that is the sun above is telling them about the sun of God. And that's kind of a neat thing. And so if you'd like to give to the uh, world mission for that purpose, that is the red pan offering um, for today. Our offertory sentence is, the Bible offers great guidance and calls us to use our gifts and abilities in the whole of our life, not just on Sunday. It is time to use our talents to give all for one, all for God, all the time. May the Lord bless the good gift and the giver. Okay. And uh, the worship committee has given you uh, some candy uh, to sweeten the sermon a little bit. So, um, and it passes around, so either you're going to take a basket. Let's pass it. So either you're a father or you had a father, so um, go ahead and celebrate that. I'd like to talk to you.
to you today about being a father. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is older, he will not depart from it. And also Psalm 103, 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Today is Father's Day, and I want to highlight that fathers make an important difference in the lives of their children. One can never underestimate the power of a loving, involved, and engaging dad. They really matter in big and small ways in the lives of their children. You may remember growing up watching TV and seeing some famous dads. Who were some of the famous dads in the 1950s if you were watching TV? Perhaps it was Ward Cleaver from The Youth to Beaver. Or maybe Jim Anderson from the show Father Knows Best. If you grew up in the 60s, more than likely that father figure would have been Andy Griffith, who raised Opie. If you grew up in the 1970s, there were a lot of shows with quality fathers who amplified being a dad. There was the show Happy Days with Mr. Cunningham. There was the Brady Bunch with Mike Brady and Little House on the Prairie with Michael Landon. If you grew up in the 1980s, the most famous dad was Mr. Heathcliff Huxtable on the Cosby Show. If you grew up in the 1990s, it was more than likely Danny Tanner from the show Full House. If you grew up in the 2000s, Phil Duffy from the show Modern Family. <laughs> I noticed a trend recently that there are a lot of shows right now that are depicting fathers in the same manner that we saw them when we were growing up. In fact, in most situations on TV, it seems like they're illustrating fathers um, in a humorous fashion, like making fun of them. Um, shows like The Simpsons or American Dad. And I wish we had some types of shows that really exemplified the high qualities of what it means to be a dad. I want to ask the question, what does it take to be a good dad? A good father makes all the difference in a child's life. A dad is a pillar of strength, support, and discipline. His work is endless and oftentimes thankless, but in the end, it shows in the sound, well-adjusted children who turn into adults. <coughs> a good father loves his children but doesn't let them get away with murder. He strongly disapproves of his children's misdeeds using tough love to prove a point. He does this through the power of his words and not his fist. Likewise, the father doesn't reward his children for actions that are expected of them such as helping with household chores or performing well in school. Yesterday, my family and Nancy and I had a beautiful opportunity to have a wedding right here in the sanctuary. And it was a wonderful opportunity uh, for my son, my second son, uh, to marry the beautiful girl that he had met three and a half years ago. And it was just beautiful in a thousand different ways. Before the wedding started, um, I was up here on stage with my sons, Joshua, and also my younger son. And on the side door, uh, my father came through, and he had just driven up from Seabrook, Florida. My mom and dad are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary this year. And as we just stood up there talking, um, it was a very tender moment, and the photographer kind of captioned that there were three generations that were up there. And he, he kind of pulled us together and said, hey, let's pose for this special moment. And we did. And it was kind of an aha moment the day before Father's Day to thank the Lord for the good father that I had. And for me being able to be a father to two wonderful boys that have turned into men. I want to share with you ten things that I believe make a good father. First, first of all, I want a father to be a leader. The Bible says that fathers are to be the spiritual leaders of the home. Ephesians 5 1 says this, that we are to be the spiritual leaders in our home. There's a quote and statistic that goes something like this. If you have children and only the mother brings the children to church, there's only a 30% chance that your children into adulthood 
will continue in the faith. If only dad brings the children to church, that moves up to 50% of the likelihood that the children will go to church. But if both mom and dad go to church and bring the children, statistics tell us that there is a 70% chance that the children will remain in the, in the faith into adulthood. So dads be a good leader. Secondly, be dependable. Being there for your children in the good and bad times takes commitment. Being there for the home duties of dinner and table around the meals, going to their games and soccer events and baseball games and basketball games, the dance recitals, piano recitals. Dad, when you begin to go to these things, that may be less golf for you, less fishing trips, less hobby time that you may have to devote to your children's development of their hobbies and their talents. It may require you becoming a Boy Scout leader, a sports team coach, or any number of ways that you can become dependable in their lives. Third, get involved. Get involved in your child's life. A dad needs to be personally engaged in their children's lives, in their interests, in their dreams, in their aspirations on a daily basis. It is a wise father that knows his own child. Be involved in your children's homework, even when it's tough. Teach them the ABCs of life. How many of you dads remember teaching your children, now this will bring back some memories, how to ride a bike? Walking beside them, hoping that they don't fall and running along as they ride the bike. How many of you remember teaching them to swim? Putting them in the water with you and holding them up until they catch it on their own. How many of you dads taught your children how to throw a ball? All these things are important. How many of you remember the dangerous, dangerous task of teaching your 15-year-old how to drive a car? <laughs> I got some gray hairs on that in my career. Maybe you did too. Fourthly, dads be compassionate. It is the rare father who is firm yet compassionate. This requires patience and self-control. Something that fathers aren't usually best known for, patience and self-control. Especially when raising teenagers. Now those of you that raise teenagers, remember that when you raise teenagers, that it's like holding a bar of wet soap. Because they have to be kind of push the soap and tighten it and tighten it, and what happens to the soap? Shoot, it pops out. Or we can hold the soap just loosely in our hands and it slips out. And it's a delicate balance, is it not, in being a father and raising a teenager to just know when to how to hold tight, but also then when to loosen it up. Thirdly, honesty. It is the wise father who is honest to their children. I remember one time. I was driving down the road with my son, and my son may have been five or six years old at the time. And it was about that time um, when, for some reason, um, they were stressing um, to buckle the seatbelts. Remember that? And, and they would pull you over, and not for any other reason, just say, put your seatbelt on. And so I was driving down the road, and he didn't have my seatbelt on, but then when I passed the police officer who was sitting outside the road, I said, oh my goodness, I put my seatbelt on. So I put my seatbelt on, and sure enough, that police officer came up behind me with a and so I thought, well, I wasn't speeding, you know, would he ask me about my seatbelt? And so I rolled down the window and he said, sir, and he noticed my seatbelt. And I was oh, you have your seatbelt on. He goes, were you wearing your seatbelt back a mile or so? And that's the moment of truth, folks. Because <laughs> I could have slipped away and said, well, of course, officer, I always wear my seatbelt on my nose. But, <laughs> but if I would have said that, what would I have taught my five-year-old son? that lying's okay. And so I said, no, officer, um, I did not. I passed by you and that reminded 